Hi everyone, thank you for joining today. I'm Joshua Dunn, the head of design at Ginkgo Bioworks, and today I'll tell you about how we use high throughput DNA synthesis to drive discovery. I'll start by giving an intro to Ginkgo. I'll then discuss at a high level the advantages of gene synthesis. I'll follow with three short case studies showing how gene synthesis powers discovery at Ginkgo. Then we'll end with a brief Q&A. So let me introduce Ginkgo. Ginkgo was founded in 2009 by Tom Knight, shown in the upper left, and four graduate students, Rish Machete, Barry Kenton, Jason Kelly, and Austin Shea, shown in the upper right. Tom, a biologist who made his first career in electrical engineering, came to the realization that biology is incredibly powerful and, like a computer, runs on code. But instead of running on bits, the code is in the form of DNA. However, and importantly, Tom, along with our, our other founders, realized that biology is also really complicated and bioengineering isn't a predictive science. Putting two and two together, they recognized an unmet need and devised the mission for our new company, which is to make biology easier to engineer. This is a mission we deeply believe in, and everything we do at Ginkgo and everything I'll talk about today is in service of that mission. Concretely, we're aiming to develop the world's most advanced platform for genetic engineering. We then use that platform to engineer cells for a broad variety of technology applications. At present, more than 70 major programs have run on our platform in roughly 50 different species scattered throughout the tree of life. One major category of project for us is to engineer the metabolism of cells to biosynthesize specialty chemicals. Now, these can be naturally occurring or totally man-made products with metabolic pathways that may or may not be known ahead of time. And these molecules support all kinds of industries, so to name a few that we've worked in, flavors and fragrances, drugs, vitamins, industrial chemicals, enzymes, food ingredients, and more. To give one example, we partnered with Kronos to develop multiple strains of a yeast that each produce a key cannabinoid. And not only does recombinant production of cannabinoids reduce the amount of land, water, and energy required to produce cannabinoids, it also unlocks large-scale large -scale production of rare cannabinoids that are found only in very small concentrations in plant tissues. We recently developed strains that reached the productivity target for one rare cannabinoid, CBGA, with a planned product launched by Kronos this fall. Another example is food protein. Our client, Motif, was interested in producing large amounts of a food protein derived from animal sources. Within two years, we were able to develop commercial strains of a yeast that are now being used to produce kilogram quantities of this food protein. We exceeded Motif's productivity specifications by more than 70% and have developed further improved traits to incorporate into future strains. Another kind of project that we work on is to develop organisms that sense, respond to, and alter their environments. One example of this type of project is our work for Join Bio on nitrogen fixation. The aim of this project is to develop a cell-based alternative to chemically produced nitrogen fertilizer. Production of chemical fertilizer causes roughly 5% of global greenhouse emissions, and use of this fertilizer causes eutrophication of fresh water when the fertilizer runs off into freshwater sources. With Join, we're developing organisms, essentially probiotics for plants, that combine two critical traits. First, the ability to fix nitrogen, and second, the ability to colonize cereal crops like rice, maize, and wheat. Now, these are both complex traits found in distinct species in the wild, and we're using our platform to combine them in a single organism so that cereal crops can be grown without chemical fertilizer. So for most of our history, we were focusing on cell engineering, and 2020 threw us a curveball and required us to think bigger and repurpose our technology for pandemic response. I won't show you everything we tried or did, but to give a few examples. Early in the pandemic, we designed and synthesized a collection of expression vectors for SARS-CoV-2 antigens as research tools. We deposited these at Adgene and the BioBricks Foundation to enable researchers throughout the world to study the virus. As of last May, these have been requested more than 1,200 times by scientists in 46 different countries. Additionally, we supported mRNA vaccine production with strain engineering and process development to increase, increase production of multiple key raw materials for multiple partners. In work for Aldevron, we recently announced a tenfold efficiency improvement in the production of vaccinia capping enzyme, um, a key vaccine production reagent that was particularly limiting uh, throughout the early phases of pandemic response. And finally, we built Concentric, a SARS-CoV-2 testing network with local centers in all 50 states in capacity for testing 60 million people per week. By leveraging pooled testing, automation principles, and spare capacity, we were able to get testing costs down to $6 per person. The way we support all these programs is by building high-throughput bioengineering labs called foundries. Now, what you see in this picture, where there are a lot of robots and very few people operating them, is, is typical of our workspaces. 
In our foundries, we rely heavily on automated equipment, not only for throughput, but also for the consistency and quality that robotics allows. At present, our foundries are able to generate thousands of strains per week, enabled by synthesis of hundreds of megabases of DNA each year at twist. In addition, we have large capacity for next generation sequencing, mass spectrometry, enzyme screens, and a variety of other capabilities that all add up to terabytes of data produced per week. So as you might imagine, it would be really difficult to do any of this without a consistent supply of high quality DNA. So now I'd like to tell you how gene synthesis can accelerate your discovery. And the fact is, the reality we're moving towards is one where manual cloning is obsolete. At Ginkgo, we design large volumes of DNA, and these feed into multiple molecular biology and strain transformation services. TWIST consistently supplies us with thousands of sequence-perfect plasmids, as well as non-clonal fragments to keep all those services running. Now, one thing that's not obvious is that this benefits both large and small volume users of DNA. High volume users benefit from low, co low cost per construct, very large scale, and automation afforded by the foundry. This allows them to execute complex experiments that include multiple variables and answer hypotheses very completely. Small volume users benefit in a different way. Rather than spend time at the bench cloning, they can spend more time on experimental strategy, data analysis, or other high-level tasks that advance their research as opposed to building the research reagents to get their job done. Synthesis at Twist is reliable, versatile, affordable, and fast. They're able to deliver verified sequence-perfect clones with inserts ranging from 300 base pairs to 500 kilobases at prices from $0.09 cents per base in 11 business days. Now, it's hard for even an expert experimentalist to consistently meet or beat that turnaround time. Now at Ginkgo, we use twist synthesis to power large-scale experiments that explore many hypotheses in parallel or answer very complex hypotheses fully. And this shortens the number of design-build test cycles we need to run through the foundry, and it also helps us to get to answers faster. So now I'd like to show you how we use synthesis with three short case studies. First, discuss how we discover enzymes to use in constructing metabolic pathways. In this project, we were looking for a rare enzyme that makes an uncommon small molecule. To complicate matters, this enzyme comes from a ubiquitous enzyme family, most members of which make a different related product from the same substrate. So we started by gathering a set of 5,500 supposed enzyme homologs from public and private databases and grouped them by similarity, which I'm showing in this two-dimensional projection on the left. In this figure, each protein sequence is one dot. Given where the dots fall, we can carve these enzymes into roughly five groups. To orient you, the rare activity we're looking for was previously known to occur in the second group labeled type 2. The more common activity that we're looking to avoid is known to occur in groups 1 and 3. On the right, I'm showing now these same groups, but they're instead colored by the taxonomic clade that the sequence came from. In addition, I've added a black dot on top of every sequence that we chose to synthesize and test in our foundry. So you can see that the rare activity we're looking for in the type 2 group is known to occur in fungal and animal species, but not so much in the plant or bacterial groups. Given that this activity was known to occur in this type two group, we heavily sampled there. And in addition, we lightly sampled over all of the other clusters because across programs, we consistently find hits, sometimes much better hits, for enzyme activity among previously unknown sequences. Here are the measured activities of each of these enzymes in a high throughput screen. On the left, you can see a lot of enzymes that are inactive. Now, these may act on a different substrate, produce a product that we weren't looking for, or require different assay conditions to be functional. That's typical. On the right, we find a variety of hits whose sequences can be further analyzed to identify either new, se new, sequ new seed sequences for subsequent searches, or residues indicative of function. Now, as I mentioned, the activity we're looking for is the production of a rare molecule, and further, the enzyme we're looking for comes from a family of molecules that more commonly makes a very ubiquitous product from the same substrate. So at Ginkgo, we can use metabolomics as well as other methods to distinguish the various products from each other and measure enzyme specificity. So here I've colored all the enzymes we've tested. On the left, enzymes are colored by the amount of desired product they made in our assay conditions where purple is low and yellow is high. On the right, those same enzymes are colored by specificity for the product that we want as opposed to alternative products. Now, as expected, many active variants appear in the type 2 cluster where there were previously known examples of enzymes that make the product that we're looking for. But interesting, we found active variants that were also highly specific in one of the poorly characterized clusters dominated by proteobacterial species as opposed to the mammalian or fungal exemplars that were in the type 2 group. 
And we also found active variants in the previously uncharacterized clusters, which we can use to refine our models and improve searches in the future. Now, if we plot specificity against activity and color points by how different the query sequence is from the, sam the sample protein we used to seed the search, you can see that many proteins with desirable specificity and activity combinations are actually quite different from the starting protein. And without the high throughput synthesis available from TWIST, there would have been no motivation or no rational reason to test these, and all of these proteins would have gone undiscovered. So having told you about enzyme discovery, I'd like to switch gears a bit and talk about protein engineering. And the specific case I'd like to talk about is work from early in the pandemic in which we sought to improve the stability of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So as you may know, spike is the surface protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus that binds to the human ACE2 receptor to enable productive infection. Now, spike itself is an unstable protein, which makes it difficult to manufacture in high quantities, and this limits the power, uh, excuse me, the production of vaccines as well as diagnostics. And in fact, the spike variant uh, used in the COVID vaccines is a stabilized double proline mutant developed by the McClellan lab at UT Austin. Uh, and this stabilized mutant increases the effective power of each vaccine dose. So in this project, we spent three months attempting to further increase the stability and manufacturability of spike, importantly, without compromising its ability to bind the ACE2 receptor or its immunogenicity. So in this case, high throughput synthesis enabled us to test 600 variants uh, derived from four parallel rational protein engineering strategies, focusing on avoiding changes in conserved epitopes, reducing aggregation pretensity of the protein, choosing changes that we inferred would synergistically stabilize the protein, and also leaving all immunogenic epitopes that we knew of intact. So I won't go through all the char characterization data, but I will show two relevant pieces. First, we did a high throughput screen for yield and shows top hits for purification at the 40 milliliter scale, which I'm showing you here. What we found was that all but one of the top hits showed increased yield versus native spike, with the top hit showing a threefold increase. Now, as I mentioned, our goal was not only to increase manufacturing yield, but to do so without reducing binding to A2, excuse me, ACE2, and without destroying any of the immunogenic epitopes. So in this experiment, we used bilayer interferometry to measure the K-on for each of our top 17 hits to ACE2, as well as to the three commercially available neutralizing antibodies against SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV-2. And what we were able to show is that not only were we able to preserve binding to these proteins, we were able to actually increase ACE2 binding fourfold and antibody, antibody binding threefold. Overall, we're able to do this um, entire program from DNA design through execution, getting these results in roughly eight weeks. So having told two stories about the world of proteins, now I'd like to move into the world of pathways and specifically into human health. So in this project, we are working with our partner Synlogic to combat maple syrup urine disease, or MSUD. Now, MSUD is a recessive human metabolic disease that affects about 1 in 185,000 infants. It's caused by defects in a multi-subunit enzyme complex called BKCDH, which is responsible for catabolism of branched-chain amino acids. Treatment of MSUD today consists of restrictive diets that avoid leucine, um, along with supplementation by isoleucine and valine. In addition, patients require clinical monitoring for life. Risks of MSUD, uh, if it's not controlled, include neurological damage and liver toxicity, leading in some cases to liver transplantation. Now, because MSUD is a metabolic disease, our partner Synlogic developed synthetic biotic. This is a genetically engineered strain of E. coli nissel that supplies three enzymes in trans to enable degradation of leucine to isopentanol in the patient's gut. So you could think of this as a probiotic that lives in your gut and acts as a living medicine. When Synlogic approached us, they had, over the course of two years, developed a prototype strain that was capable of consuming leucine in vitro, as I'm showing you on the plot on the right. But modeling showed that they would need more activity to reach a therapeutic effect in patients. So at Ginkgo, we tested 1,200 enzymes for each of the steps in their three-step prototype pathway. We then selected the best several enzymes for each step and developed a library of 350 pathways that varied the expression levels of each enzyme as well as the combinations of enzymes. Uh, we identified multiple pathways that outperformed the parent pathway, and we additionally identified one of these enzymes to be a key bottleneck across all the pathway variants we investigated. Ultimately, we delivered Synlogic an improved strain that consumed leucine sevenfold more than its parent. Synlogic then further engineered the strain with additional traits. So on the right, I'm showing you the effect of the Synlogic Ginkgo joint strain, SYN5941, in non-human primates. So briefly in this experiment, animals were dosed with the optimized strain, the starting strain, or vehicle, 
along with a leucine-rich meal. And then blood plasma levels were monitored for several hours post-bacteria administration, showing significant decreases in leucine levels in plasma throughout the course of the experiment. So today I told you stories about production of small molecules, vaccines, and diagnostics, and finally, a living medicine. But the bigger picture is that cell engineering touches every part of the economy, from food through, through therapeutics and even to consumer electronics. At Ginkgo, we're aiming to build a platform that can serve all of these sectors and become the back end of the bioeconomy. Which brings us back to Twist. It's difficult to imagine how we or anybody could serve all of these sectors without reliable sources of DNA to test in high throughput. Now, synthesis has many advantages. First, you can design what you want without having to work your plan around restriction sites, PCR troubleshooting, whatever pre-made DNA you have, what enzymes you have in the freezer. Critically for Ginkgo, synthesis enables testing of DNA from unculturable organisms, from metagenomic samples, or from other places without having to obtain a physical template of uh, that DNA to start with. As I showed in the spike example, synthesis is ideal for high throughput protein engineering when NNK libraries or other methods of generating variation don't offer enough diversity or flexibility in approach. And finally, I'd also say Twist is flexible because they allow onboarding of custom vectors. This enables us to synthesize DNA for the broad range of organisms that we work in at Ginkgo. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this is over 50 different species throughout the tree of life. Finally, I'd say working with Twist will save you time, no matter what your application or approach. So with that, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions.